Ratatouille was a, like, conspiracy to get rats back in the good graces and teach people about how the plague spread. Noteworthy, a discussion of strange things found on the internet. I'm Morgan. And I'm Jack. I'm going to share some posts from Tumblr. And I have some things from the pneumatic plague uh, quarantine zone that's Twitter. Please, please tell me what you mean by that, because why is there a plague and why is Twitter the quarantine zone? Well, you see, in China, there was a confirmed outbreak of two people having the, uh, the plague. Okay, I heard something about that. Uh Uh-huh. But also, can't the plague be killed by antibiotics relatively quickly and there's only one that's actually fatal? They got that one. They got the fatal one? Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah, they didn't get the bubonic plague. They got the other one. Okay. That's depressing. And they're trying to quarantine that off. But it's also because it's a very good intro for this first tweet that I want to share with you. Oh? I ask hesitantly and with great fear. You have to believe me. Okay. I do believe in you. Okay. The tweet is from at it's Matt Fred, and it's the Black Plague was a PR disaster for rats as a species. They never truly recovered until 2007, and then in parentheses, release of Ratatouille. <laughs> <laughs> is that tweet meant to imply that Ratatouille helped the rats, or that Ratatouille was the reintroduction of like the bad reputation of rats? Well, a PR disaster, so that means up until 2007, rats were bad. And then at the release of Ratatouille, rats were regained their, like, good graces with society. Okay, because I was gonna say, I feel like Ratatouille did some good things for rats. That's exactly the point. This is so true. It was a PR disaster, because rats are really quite great. Yeah, they're clean. And wholesome. And they are funny, and they're chill not to sound like a former employee of petco or anything but genuinely rats are like the best like if you're gonna get your child a small rodent get them a rat or three because they are social they like people they like to interact with you like working at the store we had to like go into like the rodent cages or whatever frequently to like clean them or like get one out for people Mm -hmm. and any of the other ones I've owned several of these. I've owned hamsters, I've owned mice, and I've owned rats. Hamsters and mice, they don't want to interact with you, really. They will run, they will hide, and they're gone. If you let them out, they will run away and hide under something, and you will not see them again. When I had rats, even the day that I got them, if I opened the cage, they would come up and be like, Hello, what do you want? Do you have something for me? Do you want to hang out? And I could just let them, like, free range around a room in my apartment, and they would come back. They would come up to me every once in a while just to check in because they genuinely just want interaction and like stimulation. And rats are just basically super great. That's my treatise on rats. Do you want, do you know what that reminded me of? What did that remind you of? The one time I was in your house and we were all sitting in like the lounge and one of your rats was free roaming and it came up to me and it stuck its little snout into the mouth of my vape. (laughs) (laughs) This is true. She was trying to get high on your supply. (laughs) Yes, she was. (laughs) <laughs> she's like what's this sniff 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 it smelled good but it was not where she belonged <laughs> it was not where she belonged not to like reintroduce uh things people might find unsavory but rats have this funky little thing they do where they'll come up to you and if you let them like be near your mouth they'll be like huh i wonder what's in there and they'll start cleaning your teeth for you many times when i had rats and would let them like climb all over me they would try to pull my mouth open so they could clean my teeth (laughs) there's also a direct follow-up that this person replied to their own tweet with and Uh it's making me laugh also please read it (laughs) people in my mentions talking about Stuart little Stuart little is a mouse you babbling idiots (laughs) why i i literally just face palmed like who would call Stuart Little a rat. Him being a mouse is an integral part of the plot of that film. Yeah, 
It is. He flies around in like a little plane and gets adopted like he's a human boy, which is really creepy. <laughs> the plane is the sequel. He rides a boat in the first one. And I'm recall. sorry, there's two Stuart Little movies. <laughs> I'm sorry, you haven't seen the sequel where he gets a girlfriend and the girlfriend is a canary? What? <laughs> she has a blue scarf and that's a crucial part of the plot. I think she gets kidnapped or something by an angry falcon. Oh my god, you're so right. Wait, you want to know what the, the reason that I didn't realize them was? Why? I've only ever watched Stuart Little 2. <laughs> you haven't seen the first Stuart Little movie? <laughs> no. <laughs> so you just came into it where you're like, this mouse is a part of a human family and that's rather odd. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Because in the first movie, the fact that he was a mouse adopted by a human family was a part of the conflict. Because every local cat in the area was like, what the hell? That is bullshit. He's a snack, not a person. Let's abduct him. Okay, hold on. I'm continuing to go through to the replies to this tweet. Uh, and one of them is, I don't remember what it was, but if I remember correctly, Ratatouille has like a DVD extra about the plague that explained it was actually the fleas on the rats that caused disease, and the rats have been unfairly blamed, or something like that. Ratatouille was a, like, conspiracy to get rats back in the good graces and teach people about how the plague spread. (laughs) That's entirely valid. Who tweeted that? Enthusiast human, but it's in the replies to the original. Okay. Amazing. If you go to this tweet... After listening to this podcast and you scroll through the replies, there's a bunch of good pictures of rats. And that's my treat from me to you. Hang on. Hang on. There was a post someone put. It wasn't a post. It was just an image. But someone put it in one of the Discord servers that were in the other day. And it said, rat is short for Raffu. And I really liked that image. (laughs) That is very, very good. Thank you. (laughs) It's good content. Oh, beautiful. When I had rats, all four of them were named after characters in Warehouse 13 because I am a big nerd. Aww. Amazing. Honestly, having them the most closely in terms of, like, all pets reminded me of having, like, baby puppies. Yeah. But with more dexterity. They're, like, dexterous small dogs. (laughs) As much as I've enjoyed talking about rats, I have a post for you that I would like to read. Is it rat-related? It is not rat-related. It was sent to me by Taylor. Okay. I'll hear it. My dear friend, and for all intents and purposes, my platonic wife. Um, The uh, Tumblr user is, for fuck's sake, Jim, uh, spelled exactly as it sounds, and it says, So, when I was in fifth grade, all my classmates had ganged up on me and called me a lesbian, and I didn't even know what it meant at the time. I even said, I'm Spanish, not lesbianese. Anyways, at lunch, a lunch lady had saw them making fun of me and asked what they said, and I told her they called me a lesbian, and she told them to apologize, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. And then I remember telling my teacher the next day, and as class was leaving, she asked for me to hang back. She told me that being a lesbian was nothing bad, and to just ignore them. I was like, I don't even know what a lesbian is. All I said was that Queen Amidala was so pretty I wanted to marry her. And my teacher chuckled and nodded her head before saying that I could go. (laughs) And then the original poster uh, replied to their own post and said, You know, looking back on this, I'm pretty sure my teacher was a lesbian. (laughs) Oh my god. It's just the vine. Like, yeah, it is. Hey, I'm lesbian. I thought thought you were were American. American. (laughs) Uh, You know what? It makes me think of. Mm -hmm. It's not always true, but like, you know, in like the 1800s and the early 1900s, women could be teachers, but only if they were single. Yes, I think. I might have known that. I know that because it reminds me of a book that I read that is one of my favorites. And I, if I can, while I'm talking, I'll find the title of it. But not gonna lie, probably a lot of those teachers that never got married and were just really old and always teachers, probably lesbians. Fair. (laughs) Like... They're like, oh, look at that old spinster. All she does is teach and, like, hang out with other old women that are also single and never married. And, like, that's a lesbian. Fair. 
Uh, the book was called The Teacher's Funeral. Oh, a depressing title. But a fa- very funny book. I'm glad the book is funny. The premise of The Teacher's Funeral is that there's like a small town like in Kansas, like a farming town. And it's just mm-hmm. like the story of this shithead group of kids in like a single room schoolhouse. And like their old teacher dies because mm-hmm. she's old. And then so they get a new teacher and then they kind of like do like stupid kid stuff and then like eventually like get better as students and like grow older and then like get married and do cool stuff oh that sounds nice yeah it's like a really touching like funny book i will potentially read this if i figure out how to access it i had a question i was gonna ask as a result of this post hang on let me get my brain back in order it was about teachers and lesbians what is your question yes um oh yeah i was going to ask you what was, like, something that you did as a kid that you didn't realize was, like, queer? And then later you were like, oh, that's what that was. Because I can name several examples. Do you want me to go first while you think about it? I was repressed. As was I. I didn't know that I could be gay until senior year of high school. But, like, now that I look back, I go, oh, that's why I was really interested in that thing. Oh, you were more repressed than me. Yeah. I'm saying, what's something that you didn't know was gay at the time, but when you look back, you're like, oh. Uh, I cannot think of much, because- Okay, I will tell you mine and see if it helps. Oh, so this way, I realized by, like, late seventh grade- Oh, golly. And, like, everything else before that is, like, kind of, like, just me sitting quietly alone. <laughs> I didn't have many friends- Can I tell you my thing now so that maybe it prompts something and doesn't sound so depressing? Go for it. Okay. The main one that stands out is, have you ever seen Treasure Planet? Uh, no. But I know the premise of the movie. Okay, that doesn't help. You haven't seen Treasure Planet? Okay, we're watching Treasure Planet next time we hang out. That's neither here nor there. For those of you that have, you know Captain Amelia, the lady that is also a cat, that is the captain of the ship? Okay, so there's this scene where she's introduced, and there's this big burly man made of rocks, and so, like, the people who have hired the ship start, like, addressing him as the captain, he's like, oh, no, 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 I'm not the captain, the captain's aloft, and he gestures upwards, and on the mast, this woman comes sprinting across, swings across a bunch of ropes, does a flip, and lands with perfect poise in the middle of the deck, and everyone just stands there, just, like, jaw-dropped, and I love I loved that scene so much that when I watched that movie, I would rewind and replay that multiple times. And I didn't know why, I just thought she was so cool. Yeah, I don't have anything like that. (laughs) That and basically every female character in anything ever was always my favorite, which, I mean, I guess that's pretty standard for little girls, I guess. But like, they were the ones that I was like, them, that one, that one, please. Um... Not only that, but, like, I've never had, like, a strong want or anything. Like, I've never really been into fictional characters. Ah. I've never had, like, a strong emotional reaction as such to, like, an, a fictional character. I have trouble as it is having strong emotional reactions to actual humans that interact with me. Ah. So when it comes to fictional characters that, like, I know do not feel anything and do not exist past me looking at them, I feel nothing. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't feel about fictional characters the way that I do. Because I derive great enjoyment and, like, stimulation from fictional media in general. Because, to me, they do kind of exist. Should I should I clarify that briefly? But they don't, Morgan. They're someone's story, and that's kind of cool. But they don't exist. I won't argue that they do exist, because I know that they're made up. But, like... I really love the potential in characters. In my mind, they take on kind of a life of their own. What could be their motivation for things? Because on one hand, I know there's like a narrative reason and that someone wrote this character, but I find the real richness in stories to be in figuring out like what motivated that if that person was acting organically and wasn't scripted on a page. So they have like a lot of depth in my mind and that's why I really love things like fan fiction and like how everyone interprets characters differently it's like one of my most favorite things in the world that's probably the only character that i've ever felt any attachment to i've been from homestuck i don't know how to respond to that it's just it's such like a long form comic and they the whole like plot basis was like really strong character development but there was still like lots Mm. of wiggle room in it 
And so it was wonderful. And that's the only thing that I've really like absorbed myself in. That is the first thing I've ever heard that has given me a reason to want to read Homestuck. But yeah, anyway, thank you, Taylor, for sending us this post, because now I know that Jack needs to watch Treasure Planet. Well, I've seen clips of Treasure Planet, but I've never watched the full thing. It's worth watching. Is it that one where, like, the cook has, like, the the arm, the robot arm? Yes, he is a cyborg. I like that man. You're valid. But that's only because I want cyborg legs. Is it because all your joints are bad? Maybe. Is that why you want cyborg legs? It is. We had a conversation the other day about how you stand very weird to the point where I think we're the same height, even though you're a good four inches taller than me. Yes. For those of you that will never meet me, I stand with my knees bent. Like on their tiptoes, like a strange sort of like, like if I were to do an impression of a velociraptor, I would stand how Jack stands as a default. Yeah, my default stance is slightly on the balls of my feet with my knees bent and my shoulders hunched. (laughs) <laughs> they their heels never touch the floor first and i didn't realize how bad it was until they were like no look and i was like what how yeah. i tried to explain this to some people in a discord and i had to stand up and take a picture of my legs what is your height in inch numbers on my driver's license it says five seven wow i am five three but i look directly into your eyeballs on most occasions yeah. <laughs> Jack, our podcast is out in the world now. It's true. People could be listening to us right now. Hello, it's me, Morgan, your broski, here to remind you that not only do we have a bunch of social media at NotesworthyCast on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, even YouTube, We also have a website, notesworthycast.com, and if you send us posts that you find on any of these various contact locations, then we will probably feature them in an episode because it saves us the work of going and finding them ourselves, and you get to feel special because you're part of the process. It's Thanksgiving this week, but I'm going to do my darndest to get an episode out to you guys on Tuesday, and that will be Tuesday, December 3rd. We're coming into the end of 2019 now. End of a decade. That's about all that I have for you. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Bye! Jack, do you have a tweet for me? Would you care to talk about one that reads as follows? Uh, by at it's Dan Sheenan. Sheehan? That's an H. And it's, I always feel for action movie protagonists, because imagine you're going through a divorce and also Godzilla is real. <laughs> I would like to talk about this. Because <laughs> a lot of life is already stressful. Uh-huh. But then Godzilla steps on your job. That does make life more stressful. Does insurance is... cover that? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it does. I don't I don't know if Godzilla would count as a natural disaster. I must confess I have not seen anything relating to Godzilla other than like those adorable comics where they're like Godzilla is a mommy lizard and she like climbs out of the water with all of her little baby lizards all over her and teaches them how to destroy a city. It's quite cute. I cannot remember who draws those. I'd like to argue that Godzilla would be a natural disaster. But That's fair. Godzilla might be a natural disaster. It is also reminding me of a post that I do not remember where I read or who it's from. Unfortunately, it might have been on Tumblr actually. And it Propose the concept of of villain insurance. Oh, I like that idea. Please follow that. Because I think it was specifically in uh, Gotham where Batman is set because there's so many different villains Mm -hmm. where it's like you get an insurance policy um, to protect like your home and or business from like villain related destruction. Mm -hmm. And you get to like (laughs) pick like pick a couple of villains that you want to be covered based on, like, their recent activities. Okay, but what do you do if there's a new villain on the scene? Oh, you gotta figure out how destructive that person's gonna be. Right, but, like, what if your house gets destroyed by that new person? Are you then not covered? I'm sure there's- there'd be, like, a leeway period. Maybe. Where it's, like- like, a clause. Maybe you pay a premium 
to cover all unspecified villains. I like that. But that also gives me the concept of Godzilla insurance. Godzilla insurance. Okay, but surely this tweet is predicated on the fact that every action movie, in addition to, like, the looming danger or whatever that someone has to solve, there also has to be a human interest piece. So, like, not only is there Godzilla, you're also going through a divorce. Actually, I'm pretty sure one of the Godzilla movies I watched had a very similar premise. <laughs> I'm sure it's a it, it's probably referencing that, Jack. Um, don't you think that might be a reference? There's a lot of Godzilla movies. Fair, which I think only increases the likelihood that it is a reference. It's either a reference or it's a very strong coincidence. Mm. So now, I say every action movie has these two this push and pull between major disaster and interpersonal disaster but i just saw charlie's angels a couple hours ago and as far as i recall pretty much everything that occurred was either plot related or just like the characters involved in the plot becoming friends which was refreshing it was just about like we're charlie's angels and we're gonna kick butts that is very good. Is it your turn to read me a tweet or my turn to read you a Tumblr post? I want to hear a Tumblr post because we just talked about uh, action movies. Yes, I will read you a Tumblr post. Okay. Radioactive Supersonic says, People who try to tell me things are not that deep fundamentally misunderstand me. I am not a fish desperately in search of the ocean. I am a magpie that roves the cannons, searching for shiny things to put in my nest. Whether or not it is actually given deep narrative weight by canon itself is of secondary importance to the fact that it has the potential to be interesting, and thus, I covet it. That is very good. Isn't that well put? Okay, but then, uh, Taylor Narada says, It's not that deep. Maybe not originally, but the ground is soft, and I'm ready to dig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's basically the entire fucking plot of Homestuck, though. Like, is it? It's it's not as much, like, okay, I was into Foamstuck when Homestuck was still updating, right? Were you into Homestuck or Foamstuck? Is that the name for fandom of Homestuck? No, it's just Homestuck. Okay, because I thought you said Foamstuck for a second. You did promise me you would wait to talk about Homestuck until we had a guest on our podcast who knew what you were talking about, but please continue. I'm not going to talk about Homestuck, I'm just going to talk about, like, the character, like, development stuff that happens kind of and like also how the fandom like treated the characters gotcha so a lot of how the the comic is driven is that it's like a single image and then below the image you like open like a little like chat box thing like sort of thing Mm -hmm. and it's a conversation between two characters or like even like a single character talking to themselves and So, basically, you have, like, an image to extrapolate from and then a long conversation. And so that means that the the comic a lot of time was, like, a lot of, like, two characters talking or three characters talking, which means that it was literally all, like, character development pinned to, like, a single image, which meant Mm -hmm. that the fandom sometimes would only get, like, a single, like, panel at a time and would just go hog wild on it. Like, trying to like parse out like who these people are and what they mean and who what they could do different interpretations of what's going on. Yeah, there's like still like deep discourse in the fandom, like uh, about like certain characters and like like how different people interpret like their character development and like what happened to them based on like how they treated other characters and like how their backstories played out and stuff like that. That's very it. intriguing. Uh, now it's like, uh, you have to kind of like make your own, like if you're li- you're reading Homestuck now and you're not surrounded by like seven people who are also into Homestuck, you're just kind of like, okay, it's a webcomic and it's kind of neat and maybe you don't finish it. But like if you started reading Homestuck and then you realize there was a whole fandom of people shouting about Homestuck all the time, you were like, holy shit. I got to get in on this. Yeah. And it was really fun. Homestuck that does was really sound fun. pretty lit. Now it's dead. It's actually not dead anymore. Actually, I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> Homestuck is no longer dead. It's 2019 and Homestuck came back. Homestuck 2. 
which is terrifying to me. Actually. That is frightening. Well, now we've explained Homestuck to everyone. Thank you, Jack. I actually appreciate that. And I am much more inclined to now dabble in Homestuck. I say dabble. I know it's hard to dabble in because it's huge. I feel the same thing about Worm. I've been reading it for like three years off and on, and I'm still only like eight sections into it because it's enormous. Yeah. But uh, there's one more reply to this that I have of this post, and it's from Copper Badge. And it says, the ground is soft and I'm ready to dig is the best description of the fanfic attitude that I've ever seen. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I love. That's my stuff. Like, we take these little bits and they mean nothing. But you know what they could be? Everything. And that is how fandom exists and, like, where it lives. And that is where I'm at home. That is my happy place. Uh... We have reached the end of the episode. I will courteously ask that those of you listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review, uh, because that would help us out a lot, and that would be really dope of you. And, I don't know, maybe if someone leaves a quality review, I will read it, just because it makes me feel good. I mean, not read it out loud. I will definitely read it with my eyeballs, but I may read it out loud on the podcast just because it makes me feel good on the inside. <laughs> Also, shout out to the people in, like, random Discord groups that don't even know me that I showed the trailer to and went, hell yeah, I'm gonna listen to that, and I've subscribed already, because that made my soul really happy. Uh, and if you are listening not on Apple Podcasts and somewhere else, just subscribe to it, keep an eye on it, tell a friend about it, send a tweet to us. Yeah, I guarantee if you interact with literally any of our social media, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, reply to the posts on our website. Oh, that's something I need to tell you about. But essentially, if you reply to literally anything, we will both see it immediately because we are, we crave response. <laughs> we crave interaction. I will only see the Twitter. If you want me to see something specifically, it has to be on Twitter. If it is Instagram or Tumblr, you have to specify to show it to me. That was the other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, since we put up our first three episodes, I have built a website for the podcast. It is notesworthycast.com. There is a link to it in the episode description, and you can also get it by clicking episode notes in the show description, because every time an episode goes out, we will also be posting a blog post containing both screenshots and links to all of the posts that we have discussed so that the people who came up with these things get the proper credit. Uh, so yeah, you can find all of those there. Is there anything else we need to tell people, Jack? No, I think this is a good one. Just uh, adopt some rats. Yes, rats are very good. But don't adopt rats if you cannot give them the social interaction they need because they are very social creatures. That's been our PSA about rats. Uh, thank you for listening to our podcast. We love all of you. Stay juicy. <laughs> Be kind to yourselves. Bye.